Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to the audience attending this webinar on developing resilience in second language reading. Before I begin, I want to send my sincere thanks again um, to colleagues at HKMU. Uh, special thanks go to Dr. Winfred Xun for inviting me and uh, our colleague, Ms. Pauling Fong, for handling all the professional assistance and instructions. Um, before I begin, I want, also want to thank uh, the internal and external funders supporting my research uh, of the Bilingual and Biliteracy Research Lab. Um, I want to share a little bit background of the work that my lab is doing. So it's mainly guided by four research questions. First, how do previously acquired reading competences affect subsequent reading development in an additional language? Secondly, what are the universal and language-specific processes in reading development? And how can Chinese research inform studies of bilingual and multilingual reading development? Third, how does language and literacy input in different multilingual contexts shape reading development in an additional language? And finally, what are the effective ways of integrating reading assessment and instruction in an additional language? Since this uh, research question covers different lines of work, I've been reflecting upon an emerging theme of th this uh, research program, and I've decided, well, I want to talk about resilience and share my thoughts with the audience today. Um, so this is an outline of the webinar today. I will first refer upon three questions. Why second language reading? Why resilience? How can contextual effects be captured systematically? I will share the empirical findings based on uh, five major projects with you. Um, after sharing the findings of each project, uh, I will take a moment and talk about the theoretical, pedagogical, and societal implications. Although the Q&A section is toward the end of this webinar, but in between the talk, I will uh, try to handle one question per time, okay? And toward the end, uh, I will conclude the webinar with reflections on uh, research in this line and provide some resources and references for the audience interested in this kind of research. So the first question is why second language reading? Theoretically speaking, it's important for us to differentiate being biliterate, being able to read and write in two languages versus being bilingual, being fluent in speaking and listening in two languages. First, there are many advantages uh, for being biliterate versus being bilingual in learning an additional language, in whether it's your third or subsequent languages. And one of the major rationale is that these advantages are mediated by heightened level of metalinguistic awareness, encompasses one's language analysis ability and attention control. Um, practically speaking, when we think about the larger context, the multilingual world that we are living in nowadays, uh, it's important for us to uh, relate to those majority of children or adults who are learning to read first time in their life in a language that is not their mother tongue. Hey, the U.S., for example, 10% of the K-12 population that is about 4.8 million English learners, they first learn to read in English that is different from their home language. However, uh, in existing literature, there's still a single monolingual or English-based view of literacy development, which is not sufficient to explain and support a learner's biliteracy development. The second question will be why resilience? So resilience is commonly defined as the ability to bounce back or recover uh, from stress. Uh, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, exactly, there's rising hate against uh, the Asian or Asian American communities in the US. But the good news is that there's unexpected resilience in maintaining the heritage language and culture across generations in the U.S. Before the pandemic, uh, according to the rich literature, actually by the time of children get to the second or third generation, there's a significant loss in their heritage language. But it's a different case okay, during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And today I'm going to talk about linguistic resilience. It refers to a sense of affirming confidence in one's multilingual abilities that can transcend monolingual notions of educational success. So what I've been talking about are based on more Western, uh, Westernized perspectives. I also want to remind you of um, the wisdoms in East Asian uh, arts based on Jitsu or Kinjuki. So uh, instead of highlighting, um, sorry, instead of amending the bricks in a piece of pottery, Jitsu or Kinjuki will try to highlight the bricks instead. So in this piece of pottery, Jitsu and Kinjuki can teach us about um, the, um, the courage to embrace vulnerability, building on strength, and taking pride in diversity, and that's related with resilience. The first question will be, how can contextual effects be captured systematically? Um, I guess the audience mostly are studying or researching about second language acquisition, and oftentimes there might be a misconceptualization that everything depends. <laughs> And I hope that toward the end of this webinar, your takeaway won't be, it depends. Instead, you'll think about that resilient or strength-based research with multilingual learners is different from gap or deficit-based research, which mainly compares multilingual learners against so-called native monolingual speakers. Uh, instead, resilience-based research will try to understand the heterogeneous profiles of multilingual learners and take into consideration of a wide range of first language L1s, second language L2s, and specific contextual or societal factors. Because there are so many factors, uh, it's important for us to think about them systematically, try to catch them at the micro, meso, or macro level. So at the micro level, I will share about three uh, study, uh, three research projects uh, that examine the effects of metalinguistic and linguistic factors on second language reading development. So these projects involve American University English speaking learners of Chinese as a foreign language, a meta-analysis of the role of morphology in child bilingual reading development, and English as a third language L3 literacy development in ethnic minority learners in China. At a meso level, I'm interested in the effect of different program types. Uh, I will talk about a case uh, in which I compare L1 Chinese university students' acquisition of L2 English reading comprehension in two different contexts. One is English as second language, ESL context in the US. The other is EFL, English as a foreign language context in China. And finally, I will talk about a in-progress research project uh, thinking about the influence of COVID-19 pandemic-related discrimination on uh, Chinese immigrant children's development of trilingualism and biliteracy. And this final project will showcase how to connect all the dots together, including micro, meso, and macro level factors. So first, let's uh, begin with the micro level factors. Uh, guide, the first project is guided by this question, how does morphological awareness, one of the major facets of metalinguistic awareness, contribute to learning to read ability measured by multi-character word reading and reading to learn ability measured by lexical inferencing, uh, meaning to guess unknown word meaning during reading. Uh, with the participant group uh, consisting of American University English speaking learners of Chinese as a foreign language. Let me explain uh, morphological awareness briefly. So morphemes are the smallest functional and meaningful units in the language. Morphological awareness uh, refers to one's conscious awareness of the morphemic structure of words and one's ability to reflect upon and manipulate that structure. Um, for example, I wonder any of you have heard of the word robot sectionist. So what does robot sectionist mean to you? A morphologically aware learner might be able to first segment the word into robot and sectionist, then try to relate to their previous word language uh, knowledge, like robot means robot, sectionist means receptionist. So 
robot receptionist. Perhaps it means a robot that serves as a receptionist, right?、Uh, and this picture shows you、uh, Tank, who is a robot receptionist,、uh, served for NASA before and now retiring at Carnegie Mellon University in the U.S. And last, that will be manipulation and application.、Um, So, morphologically aware learner will be able to apply this kind of newly learned morphemic structure to new contexts or new word learning. Perhaps you will be able to create new words like robot reader or robot driver, etc. So,、uh, morphological awareness plays a really important role in literacy development across different languages and different orthographies. There are many benefits associated with it. So I will just highlight one that's related with、uh, resilience.、Um, the second、uh, benefit that's、uh, morphological awareness is a resilient factor when learners or readers have、uh, weakness in assessing phonological information in reading. So it can be a compensation factor. So in this first project,、uh, um, the first major finding regarding learning to read will be、uh, first language English morphological awareness is related with second language Chinese morphological awareness, which subsequently predicts Chinese two character word reading and Chinese multi character word reading. Most importantly, there's no influence from. Second language linguistic knowledge measured by vocabulary or grammar at all. The second finding related with reading to learn as an outcome,、uh, measured by multi-character word meaning inferencing,、uh, tells us that there's no significant uh, uh, contribution from first language morphological awareness in English. Instead,、uh, second language morphological awareness and second language linguistic knowledge are the key predictors. And when we look at their interrelationships. Chinese、uh, morphological awareness contributed to Chinese linguistic knowledge. Then, Chinese linguistic knowledge contributed to Chinese multi-character word meaning inferencing. So, what does it mean?、Um, in other words, morphological awareness is immediately shareable in learning to read in a second language, and it does not depend on a learner's vocabulary or grammar knowledge. But when it comes to reading to learn, for example, guessing new word meanings during reading, that's more linguistically demanding. The contribution of morphological awareness is depending on one's、uh, L2 proficiency level, for example, measured by vocabulary and grammar. So,、uh, in project one, it was a kind of small population、uh, with two languages, English and Chinese only. Uh, are the findings generalizable, you know, to a wider population? The answer is yes, based on the findings of second、uh, project. This is a meta-analysis、uh, that included um forty thirty four correlational studies involving about forty four thousand ish、uh, participants in ten different languages,、uh, and this ten different languages cover four major writing systems across the world. And I'm showing you a a chart of the meta correlations between morphological awareness in first or second language and reading outcomes in second language, including word reading and reading comprehension. And according to the findings of this meta analysis,、um, there were significant correlations、uh, between morphological awareness in either L1 or L2 and different L2 reading outcomes. Uh, notably, second language morphological awareness plays a more important role, and、uh, it is also found that、uh, the magnitudes or strengths of the correlation、uh, depending on how you measure morphological awareness. And another important moderating factor is age.、Uh, morphological awareness turns out to be more important to, for bilingual readers at great. Three and above, so it's more important for older learners.、Uh, now let's take a moment to reflect on the implications for resilience-based bilingual or multilingual reading research and education. First, teaching learners vocabulary and grammar alone won't help them learning to read in a second language, so it's not insufficient. Secondly,、uh, small wings big. 
while uh, when we focus on morphological awareness or when we focus on morphemes in reading instruction, it's actually beneficial for both learning to read and reading to learn in an additional language for learners throughout the school years and for learners who are both language majority or minority in the society. And finally, you may wonder, like, how can you include uh, explicit morphological instruction in the classroom? According to a recent scoping review that I conducted, uh, in integrated morphological instruction, meaning you include morphological instruction uh, with other holistic uh, language education approach, it's more effective than standalone morphological instruction. So now I actually want to uh, stop for one minute and see whether you have any questions about metalinguistic and or linguistic factors uh, in second language reading development. Does the audience have any questions? Feel free to post them in the Q&A box, okay? If not, I will move on. Okay, excuse me. So uh, I've been talking about metalinguistic uh, related factors, excuse me. Next, I want to share uh, my reflection with you about an underexamining linguistic factor that is uh, L1 first language writing system use or L1 writing system experience. So in this project, uh, I mainly investigated how previously acquired reading competencies affected reading development in uh, a third language. Uh, the participants were about 500 freshmen from a major university in Guangdong, China. Uh, and I tested their English listening and reading comprehension based on the English placement test. About 10% of the freshmen were ethnic minority or EM students. Um, so there are four major challenges in tertiary level EFL teaching and learning for uh, ethnic minority students in China. First, it is wild, widely known uh, the English curriculum is mainly exam oriented, but there are very limited English educational resources for EM students. And there is a median of instruction dilemma uh, because when English is taught as a subject, uh, teachers might switch back to Chinese instead of uh, ethnic minority languages for EM students. And all these three factors will lead to affected sociocultural and psychological issues uh, for EM students. So what do we know from research? First, it's important for us to acknowledge that EFL literacy is beneficial for EM students' cognitive and psychological development and socioeconomic prospects. And there was no effective top-down guidance for tertiary level EFL teaching practice for EM students, unfortunately, although some universities might adopt a preference policy, meaning they will lower the benchmark score for English tests for EM students, it turned out to be counter-effective. It's not helping them improving English at all. Um, the good news is uh, some researchers uh, who uh, actually devoted bottom efforts uh, seem to yield improvement in EM students' EFL writing, uh, but we know very little about reading. In existing literature EM students, um, although they are often reported to be socially precision or even self precision as poor English learners, very few empirical studies have actually assessed their English literacy profiles. So uh, in this project, when I try to assess uh, the students' illiteracy profiles uh, through listening comprehension and reading comprehension tests, I categorized uh, the participants into three groups. The first groups were EM students with functional writing systems of very limited usage, including uh, languages like Bu Yi, Li Su, etc. Um, the second group are EM students with functional writing systems of broad usage, including Hui, Miao, Mongolian, Uyghur, Yi, and Zhang. And finally, we have the high majority students speaking Mandarin Chinese. So uh, there are a few major findings. First, counter to the stereotype of EM students as poor English learners, EM students' English listening comprehension was not different from that of high majority students. They performed as well as high majority students. 
there were indeed significant intergroup variability within the EM students. Um, so when we look at um, the middle group, um, EM students who have functional writing system of broad usage in their EM languages perform as well as the high majority language uh, group in terms of both listening comprehension and reading comprehension. And uh, the EM students with uh, broader usage of functional writing system in their L1 uh, perform better in reading comprehension compared to the EM students who uh, rarely use uh, their EM writing system. So what are the implications again? It's important for us to assess and recognize individual differences and strengths in language and ethnic minority students instead of treating them as a homogeneous group. And building on the first point, systemic uh, design integrating assessment instruction versus adopting a holistic standardized Chinese median curriculum is needed to promote sustainable, culturally and linguistically responsive practices. Uh, so how can we translate that into classrooms? So for teachers who are teaching classes mixed with high majority and EM students, it's important for them to apply multi-model instruction, even it's, if it's a intensive or extensive reading class, because according to the findings, EM students actually perform as well as high majority in terms of listening comprehension. So teachers can build upon their stronger oral language when it comes to literacy development in English as a third language. Again, I want to stop for one minute to see whether there's any questions, comments from the audience. Okay, if not, now we will look at a different level. Uh, let's move up to meso level. Um, so for this project, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ryan Miller, Ms. Xiao Meng Li, and Dr. Uh, Hua Chongchao for their assistance in data collection. This project is guided by one question. Does program type influence our interpretation of the key components of reading according to simple view of reading, listening comprehension uh, plus uh, or multiply by word decoding will predict one's reading comprehension ability? So uh, this project consisted of two mini studies, or I would say two groups of participants. They were L1 Chinese participants, uh, both attended primary, middle, and high schools learning EFL in mainland China, yet uh, received different le English language education in higher education setting. Uh, one group was recruited from a English ESL bridging program in the U.S., the other group was recruited from EFL classes in China. Uh, for this two group, the amount of oral and print exposure were not equivalent. So it's dominant out to English input for the ESL group, but it's uh, prevalent L1 Chinese input for the EFL group. The participants were matched in terms of age and gender ratio. I tried to uh, control other socioeconomic uh, factors and they both groups were at intermediate English proficiency levels. So I'm showing you a uh, figure uh, including four measures of their reading abilities. The first one is let's go inferencing, inferencing unknown word meaning. Second, word decoding ability, for listening comprehension, and finally, reading comprehension. So the blue bar showcased uh, the accuracy rates for ESL learners, and the orange bar shows the accuracy rates for EFL learners. So according to the findings, uh, listening comprehension surprisingly did not have any significant effects predicting either ESL or EFL learners reading comprehension in English, meaning the simple view of reading uh, developed from alphabetic uh, Western language is not applicable to the two L1 Chinese university learner groups examining in the research. In the ES context, there were two important predictors, both let's go inferencing and word decoding were significant predictors of reading comprehension in English. In the EF, EFL context, however, there was only one significant, significant predictor that is let's go inferencing. So what's the takeaway uh, based on this project? 
um, researchers or instructors should not assume that learners of the same L1 background, that is Chinese in this case, will adopt the same or similar strategies toward reading comprehension. And the types of English input and adoption of English as the medium of instruction can have a profound impact on the manner in which L1 Chinese learners approach or comprehend L2 English texts. And according to the findings of this project, it's important for us to first identify learners' strength and weakness in reading comprehension. And it's important to incorporate component skills often ignored in existing Western-based or English-based literature that is less go inferencing, word meaning inferencing, in addition to word decoding and listening comprehension. Um, Again, I want to pause for a minute, just in case if you have any questions. Okay. If I'm going too fast, let me know, and I will start and explain some of the concepts. For the uh, final project, Project 5, as I mentioned earlier, this project focused on uh, COVID-19 pandemic a related discrimination and its effect on Chinese immigrant children's development of biliteracy. And I want to uh, thank my team members or collaborators, including Dr. Ho Yang from Florida State University. So uh, she specializes in child development and Ms. Uh, Yu Yan Xia uh, from University of Kentucky. She's a PhD student specializing in psychometrician. So uh, through teamwork, we try to incorporate all different levels of factors in this project. The goal of the project is to provide novel evidence that guides literacy practices at home, community, and school levels to reduce discrimination by investigating the mechanism through which Chinese dual language learners develop resilience in the face of discrimination and inequalities. So again, I want to remind you, uh, when we measure resilience, uh, we think about linguistic re resilience and measure it as biliteracy competence as opposed to English-only literacy. And we adopted an explanatory sequential mixed methods design with quantitative and qualitative data collected via different uh, research tools, including child biliteracy testing, parental survey, and interviews with parents, school teachers, and administrators. Um, and I'm more like a quantitative person. So some of the advanced uh, statistical approaches that we use include latent profile analysis, multinomial logistic regression, and moderation and mediation regression modeling. I think this is the most technical slide uh, in my uh, in this webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to post it toward the end and we can talk about this. So to give you a little bit idea of the setting of this project, uh, it's still in progress. So far, we have about 162 caregivers and families from the US. Um, they were families of Chinese dual language learners between five and seven years old. So they uh, are enrolled in kindergarten to grade two at the moment. And I'm gonna present you the parental survey data we collected via Amazon Turk and Quadrix uh, in this past summer. Um, I'm showing you some items we adopted from previous studies uh, trying to ask parents about their perceived discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one item, for example, I or my family member have been verbally assaulted because of my or my family member's race or ethnicity, like being yelled at, go back to China, or go back to your country. And there's five point scale. Five meaning it happened to me and the severity was very high. Um, so based on, on the survey findings, Chinese American immigrant families continue to experience discrimination before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it, it did not just happen during the pandemic. Uh, they had this kind of experience before the pandemic. And there was a significant increase, uh, unfortunately, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the other factor that, that we are interested in will be uh, the dual language learners by literacy profiles in uh, this 
project, and we confirmed that there are actually significant individual differences in Chinese dual language biliteracy profiles. Uh, to remind you, in previous literature or more biased uh, conceptualization of Chinese immigrant children, they are often thought of as um, having an accent in English, so they are not competent in English. Um, there's a, another conflicting st stereotype of Chinese immigrant children, that is the minority, uh, the model minority stereotype. And this conflicting stereotypes actually lead to really bad educational outcomes, meaning while well, their English is not good enough, but they would not need help because they would just work really hard at school. Um, but according to our findings, like they do not fall in any um any type of the stereotypes, uh, actually, they vary a lot in terms of their biliteracy profiles. About thirty eight percent of them uh, are English dominant um, biliterate children, um, and then seventy percent were balanced low, twenty four percent were Chinese dominant, and twenty one percent were balanced high. Okay, and we uh. Ended up with these profiles uh, by measuring their oral Chinese vocabulary knowledge, print Chinese vocabulary knowledge, oral English vocabulary, and print English vocabulary knowledge. Um, then we tried to connect um, the interrelationship between discrimination, biodiversity profiles, and micro muscle and macro factors together. What factors differentiate the balance high? dual language learners from other dual language learners based on multinomial logistic regression. Um, it means what were the odds if one fell into the other category versus the balance high category. And we identify a range of factors, excuse me, including uh, child's interest in reading Chinese, a mother's English proficiency level, father's Chinese proficiency levels, and uh, home literacy environment, including English interactive activities, ranging from watching TV to singing songs and playing games on the tablet, Chinese interactive activities, code-based teaching, including teaching English letters explicitly, teaching Chinese characters, teaching Chinese pinyin, etc. Weekend school attendance is an important factor. And finally, we did not identify any significant effect of COVID-related discrimination, meaning actually these children are resilient against COVID-related discrimination, but we did identify an effect of pre-COVID discrimination. So to put it into details, what factors differentiate the balanced high uh, dual language learners from balanced low uh, dual language learners? Um, so if there is an increase of frequency of English interactive activities. It's more likely for uh, a learner to be a balanced low dual language learner. However, if there is an increase in your child's interest in reading Chinese, an increase in father's Chinese proficiency level, and weekend school attendance, uh, it's more likely for a child to become a balanced high dual language learner. In other words, it takes a village to raise a balanced high bilingual uh, learner in English and Chinese. What factors differentiate the balanced high dual language learners from English dominant dual language learners then? Um, we found that if there is an increase in mother's English proficiency level, and if there is an increase in parents perceive pre-COVID discrimination experience, uh, it's more likely for one to be a dominant uh, in, a dual language learner. However, if there's an increase in father's Chinese proficiency level, it's more likely for one to be a balanced high dual language learner. In other words, father's participation is important for Chinese heritage language maintenance. To continue, what factors differentiate the balanced high dual language learners from Chinese dominant dual language learners? Um, it makes sense for us to find that if there is an increase in Chinese interactive activities and code-based teaching activities, it's more likely for one to be better in Chinese and to be a Chinese dominant dual language learner. Surprisingly, we found that if there is an increase in father's Chinese proficiency level, it's more likely for one to be a balanced high dual language learner. 
What does it mean? Again, father's participation is important for Chinese heritage language maintenance. And the good news it will be it will not impede a child's English learning, which is really, uh, I think it's really good news. To take all this together, there's a reciprocal relationship uh, between linguistic resilience and biliteracy competence. And we need to move away from current discontinued literacy practices for Chinese immigrant children and bridge practices at the home, community, and school levels against discrimination and inequalities. To remind you, uh, when we try to differentiate balanced low from balanced high learners, it takes a village uh, for us to do that. And moving forward, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this project is still in progress. Uh, we still need to gather more data from school teachers and administrators. Uh, and we are in the process of preparing two manuscripts and we'll make this questionnaire, language and literacy input questionnaire for Chinese dual language learner open access. Uh, so I hope that I can share with the audience later. Now, let me actually summarize and reflect on developing resilience in second language reading. Uh, I already say there is a reciprocal relationship between linguistic resilience and biliteracy competence. And there is a need for systemic micro, muscle, and macro level investigations of metalinguistic, linguistic, and contextual factors in bilingual and multilingual reading. Um, to reach this goal, we need to have boundary crossing collaboration in research and teacher education. Remember when I talk about morphological awareness at the beginning, if you're considering including morphological awareness instruction in your classroom, you might need training in linguistics, second language acquisition, literacy, assessment instruction, and fieldwork practicum. So one course is not enough. So uh, we have really limited time and I've talked about like different projects. So if you have a specific question about a specific project and you do not have time to raise it in this webinar, feel free to email me. Uh, most of the findings can be found in my publications through our uh, lab website. And I will, let me copy this list of references uh, for you. So these are some of the um major papers related to my talk, uh, including two recent books, okay, uh, encompassing both child bilingual uh, development and adult level uh, second language literacy development. So uh, now um, I see that there's like one question in the Q&A, right? Okay, let me try to post this reference list before I forget, and I will go to the question. Right. Thank you very, very much for the inspiring sharing, Echo. Uh, the ideas are really very clearly presented, making them quite easy to follow. And right now, I would like to open the floor for discussion or questions. And I can, uh, as Echo said, see a question. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps if you are interested in asking more questions, please type the questions there. And um, you can also um, turn on the speaker and ask the questions later on. And um, so there is one question, I think, uh, from Laura. And so she asked, in project four, why is it that listening comprehension doesn't contribute to reading comprehension? And so could you explain the tasks about listening comprehension and reading comprehension? Thank you. That's a really uh, good question, really good insight catching this. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize the implication will be if we didn't find any significant correlation between listening comprehension and reading comprehension, that means simple video reading, the formula is not applicable to Chinese learners of English. That's really weird, right? Um, so there are two possible rationales. First, for this group of learner, they were intermediate level uh, English learners, perhaps their listening comprehension ability is not high enough. Secondly, there is uh, this oral distance, oral language distance between Chinese and English so that Chinese learners cannot make the dots connected. And I'm not the first one to find uh, this uh, pattern. I think Uchikoshi at uh, University of California, uh, Irvine, she had a study with uh, Chinese immigrant children in the US and she finds similar um, pattern that there was no significant correlation between listening and uh, 
uh, reading comprehension. A third possibility will be how uh, Chinese learners have been taught to read English. So mainly relying on the visual information, right? Uh, get trying to get morphological and semantic information <clears throat> and not relying on the phonological route. So as I mentioned, there are three possible rationales. Um, Dr. Chang, uh, where can I like, post like, the reference list in the Q&A or chat box? So I'm not sure which one shall I do. I think you can just simply post it in the... Uh chat box oh yeah to everyone sorry right. okay are there other questions right in fact i have heard that my colleague winfred has some questions for you so maybe i'll just oh, oh. invite uh winfred to turn sure. on the speaker and ask the questions winfred Ah, sorry. Oh, like I just <laughs> unmute myself. So um, thank you so much, Echo. And it's great to see you after three years. <laughs> <Really. laughs> um, thank you so much for Azula and chair these sections. And I am really inspired by Echo's talk. I still remember you started from morphological awareness from your book. <laughs> this way and now after after um after not so many years just after several years you have actually added and added so many components into your project and then make it become a kind of like a more macro one and also more impactful one i can see that especially you have turned ma and also biliteracy and also multilingual reading into an accent in american context and helping those like uh how to say different stakeholders to better minister language teaching and also language teacher education so uh i think i i have more than a comment but like uh, more than a like comment but not a question so like mm -hmm mention about the inclusion of like for example um like ma all these kind of things into the pre-service language teacher training program mm -hmm. how that your finding it's are really insightful and also practical for our future teachers i mean to grab them and then take back to the like you know into the language classroom because like we are also like we both are doing like pre-service language teacher training so I'm really interested in like where we can find such like takeaway and then mm -hmm. we just maybe spend one or two lectures and then as a kind of a quick takeaway, you know, for our students to to mm -hmm. better utilize those like findings mm -hmm. of to our like um like second language reading teaching or by mm -hmm. reading or multilingual reading. Yes. Sure. Um Thank you for following on that thought. Yeah. So are you seeing my slide uh, title references and resources? So this mm -hmm. book called Playing with Language, uh, there's an like, important chapter, how to uh, teach children morphology. Uh, that's morphological awareness. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. there are many examples that can be utilized by teachers immediately. Although it focuses on elementary reading, it should be applicable to adult level uh, reading as well. And I have some supplementary slide related with that. Uh, so I try to make the talk uh, less technical, but I want to remind the audience, whether you're a researcher or teachers, morphology will be the future wow. if you're focusing on literacy. Uh, I bet yes. some of you are parents, you might heard of phonics. Or if you're a teacher, oh, you might yeah. heard of phonics, right? It's all about phonics these days, teaching English. But actually, the trend will be moving from phonics alone to morphology. <laughs> Basically, uh, if you look at, um, let's see, the trend in the US right now, um, for some re reason, a uh, special issue of the science of reading. So phonics uh -huh. alone is not enough. So uh, morphology, uh, although it seems the idea starts from Chinese, Chinese is a morphing based yes, language yes. versus alphabetic language. It seems like phonology or phonics makes more sense, right? But actually, it's universal. Morphology is universal for learning to read yeah. in Chinese, English, and other alphabetic languages. Um, so in research side, from research side, there's a lot of evidence supporting this, and there are so many different projects going on how to assess and teach morphology. But I will say uh, 
Chinese-based research and Chinese educators can be the leaders uh, talking about how to implement morphological instruction uh, at the U Chinese University of Hong Kong. You have this huge group uh, led by uh, Dr. Mai Bright Chen. So uh, mainly investigating what is morphological awareness in Chinese and also uh, colleagues from Hong Kong U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. we want to continue this topic uh, and think about, well, how we can apply research ideas to train teachers to oh, test yeah. yes. morphological awareness and teach about the, I think, yeah, th there's like a uh, need there. Or also, if we are interested in developing app, like education app for the future yeah. and profit from it, well, morphology will be the thing to go. Because if you're a parent, you will see so many advertisements about phonics, right? Oh. <laughs> uh, but I rarely see any advertisement about morphology. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, I just have another question while you're talking to me. Um, I just, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, audience. Um, I just want to chat um, if you have like consider like, for example, proficiency of the learner as a kind of uh, mm -hmm. indicator in when you investigate your, like when you conduct your study, because uh, in my opinion, like according to my experience, it may be mm -hmm. the, even the same groups of learner, like mm -hmm. for example, Chinese ESL learner in the same university. Oh. So the proficiency level actually uh, is quite different so and that that's yes. because of the different proficiency level uh it could be possibly uh affects their use of these like ma and other like uh, reading strategies in their reading comprehension so yeah uh so that's a really good question um it depends on the goal of your uh instruction if the uh, goal okay. is first for them to learn to read in the language uh proficiency doesn't matter you can start from zero from the beginning especially if you're working with adult learners because uh -huh. they already they already have morphological awareness in their first language they just okay. need to learn how to map it for children uh, uh according to research they also can start from the very beginning actually for mm -hmm. weaker learner or a lot of immigrant second language learner they need the explicit instruction from the very beginning because they will not be able to pick it up naturally like native speakers mm -hmm. um, but if your goal is to ask them to read to learn based on content for example they're actually reading to learn math or reading to learn science or reading to learn other subjects they need some scaffolding in terms of proficiency or mm -hmm. linguistic knowledge. Um, and I want to emphasize that according to the meta-analysis, I did not find any significant moderating effect of L2 proficiency. Well, what? but since after, so I published this in 2021, but there are many more morphological awareness studies. And if the audience is interested, you can do a replication study to see or a replication meta-analysis to see whether you can find any proficiency-related effects. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Thank you, Echo. Welcome. Thank you for the good questions. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Are there more questions from the floor? If not, maybe I'll just simply ask Echo a question. Um, in fact, in a webinar, you introduced a few studies that you conducted. So um, uh -huh. I see that we have got quite a lot of researchers and students here. So um, could you just share with us the major challenges you encountered when conducting your studies and what you did to handle them? Oh, that's <laughs> a big question. Let me go back to the first slide. Yeah, um, so as I mentioned earlier, I have different pieces like you know different kind of questions i would say for research students or if you are early career scholars um well you, it's important for you to try to reflect and try to connect the dots together that's how i come up with but like a theme resilience for this webinar uh i would say it's important for you to go deeper uh, in one line of research uh, it also depends on your uh, career developmental plans, but most of the time you need to have a solid line of research uh, or a identity <laughs> to represent it to others. For example, um, when others think of me, I will be a second language reading researcher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for the challenges, oh wow, I would say uh, 
I'm doing a lot of interdisciplinary research, especially with reading. Um, for people who are working on reading, you can be working in education, in psychology, in neuroscience, or like us as applied linguists, different from different disciplines. So uh, you actually need to read a lot of different uh, literature in terms of the areas. Uh, I, and I would say always reach out to collaborators. Um, for example, as I mentioned, for this uh, final project that I mentioned, um, we have a child development uh, researcher. We have psychometrician, and this is a mixed method uh, project. Uh, me personally, I really do quantitative and psycholinguistic study, so I do need to self study a lot of uh, qualitative uh, research and studies to to be able to carry out this kind of project. Mm -hmm. And the implication for research students will be if you specialize in one kind of research, for example, quantitative or qualitative or mixed method, it's, still, it's important for you to be more open-minded um, to other areas. Yeah. Right. Um, so let me just check. Oh, so I have one question uh, from Phoebe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, she said, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful project presentation. So she has got two questions for today's notion of linguistics resilience. The first mm -hmm. question, if we are addressing the bounce back and setbacks, do we have cases for strong performers not feeling ready to be labeled for scaffolding support? And for question mm -hmm. two, when we separate the sessions of multiliteracies into academic criteria or papers, do we face other limitations of balancing the whole body meaning making process in academic literacies with high focus on multimodalities? Mm -hmm. um, I try to understand the question and not to misinterpret. Uh, so Phoebe, do you mind actually turn on your mic and talk to us a little bit and explaining your thoughts? Like, can we allow Phoebe to talk? I yeah. think so. Yeah. But I um, have to check. Please wait for a second. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I'm sorry because I'm on leave today. So uh, I'm using my mobile phone to attend your section. Maybe uh, I will verbalize my uh, questions. Thanks for uh -huh. your nice uh, project presentation. Because I'm a researcher on translanguaging and transsemiotizing oh. to me, uh, your okay. topic is wonderful because you show very strong aspect of supporting social equity and mm -hmm. also in terms of facing uh, setbacks or limitations, mm -hmm. uh, especially during pandemic situation. Uh, my question for number one would be, uh, because sometimes when people are facing challenges, they don't mm. feel ready to be uh, classified or identified in the process of uh, seeking help or because mm. uh, in your project, you try to help them uh, to mm -hmm. support them. It's a very positive image. But how about if some students are or parents are very reluctant, mm. they just want to stick to the monolingual ideology <laughs> and then mm -hmm. they think that you're mislabeling them and by mm -hmm. putting forward by literacy. So what mm -hmm. kind of uh, cases have you encountered if you see some, mm -hmm. you know, some reluctant mm -hmm. cases to mm -hmm. join or to, mm -hmm. to show their mm -hmm. response? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so, wow, I had a lot of things to say about that. So I haven't shared the interview data with you and it's so fascinating and interesting. Uh, to the audience, uh, if you know about the literature, Chinese parents are being famous for saying one thing, but acting differently at home. <laughs> so when we conducted the interview, uh, we conducted semi-structure intervals, meaning we, st we stick with the questions, try not to lead them to saying that, you know, uh, being bilingual is better than being English monolingual because some of them actually think uh, it's totally fine for them to be fluent in English only. Um, so I will share uh, some of my reflection based on uh, 10 uh, cases I have so far. Uh, number one, when it comes to discrimination, there's actually a lot of individual differences. Most of the parents, uh, and we have a wide range of socioeconomic status, not just middle class parents, they tend they didn't report like any significant uh, experience. It's really different from the survey, okay? Uh, 
out of the 10 cases, there's only one case, okay, reporting a significant experience uh, that's frustrating for her. She, uh, she went out with her children and parents, grandparents. So uh, she said it's really, they will stick to English uh, outside and it's her policy telling the child that uh, outside English is the go-to language. But because grandparents were there, they switched back to English and there's a, like a really rude guy coming, telling them you should speak English in this country. And that's the only instant uh, that she shared uh, with me. Um. But not observing or not reporting perceived discrimination, as I mentioned el uh, earlier, can be viewed as some kind of receiving, right? And another important uh, takeaway I want to share will be, uh, because I focus on literacy practices, okay, there's actually good news because of the pandemic. People try to stay home more for most of the time, and they talk more, communicate more with their children based on the interview. Uh, and they also have non-traditional learning method other than attending weekend school, which most children hate. Okay, they have more interactive remote online, innovative Chinese programs online to maintain their heritage language. Okay, so all this different kind of new uh, factors actually contribute to intergeneration communication about uh, maintaining uh, the heritage language. So I hope that this answer uh, your first question. So what I learned from the interview data, it's not finalized yet. If you're interested, we can communicate through email later. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, for the uh, very good yeah, time. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> for the second question, could you reiterate your thought on multimodalities? Yeah, because actually, uh, in the beginning of your sharing, I heard that you mentioned that a lot of oh. uh, students when they are using English as a target academic language, they may join TOEFL, IELTS, try oh, to yeah. prove, prove their abilities to meet their academic literacy uh, mm -hmm. benchmarking. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, I, I'm thinking about, because uh, uh, because I'm being supervised by uh, some scholars in Korea as well, content and language integrated learning. Oh, yeah. often, if we try to follow uh, the academic unit, uh, categories of like uh, mm -hmm. you have a reading paper, you have a writing paper, you have a listening mm -hmm. paper and speaking. To me, that it seems that it's like uh, cutting down the whole body meaning making process into mm. into some channels. But mm. the, those channels, when the students are being trained, they try to focus on a particular end goal or perspective mm -hmm. of competence instead of multi. Uh, and go competence. So, mm -hmm. so that's my major thought about the second question is, would this kind of, you know, uh, mind setting in terms of training mm -hmm. academic paper literacy skills and also competence uh, modes, uh, mm -hmm. separate them into very um, independent modules, mm -hmm. would that actually uh, challenge the bridging back to higher education or other level when students are going to the laboratory, they need to do uh, mm -hmm. chemistry or biology related experiments and then um, visualize everything and understand their, their knowledge behind and then write a report. And then it's all whole body meaning making action based and oriented rather than separated them into very static, you know, form of academic paper. That's my questions in mind for the second one, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure whether the findings I presented can answer your question. I'm just sharing my thoughts with you on this. So uh, think about TOEFL. Um, they're trying to develop authentic academic text, right? So even if they are testing writing, they might include some lecturing, like listening. So you listen first and then you write or you read first and then you write. So even if it's not a perfect text, they try to include multimodal uh kind of testing that represent real world practices. I think the question for both researchers and teachers will be, okay, yeah, the world is not perfect. We need to help students to reach these standards, pass this kind of standardized test. What if, if you were practicing multi-model, more meaningful kind of instruction, can this practice help students to translate it into standardized tests? So in my kind of research, for example, if I test them, if I implement morphological instruction, I'm gonna test them with researcher design material that's aligned with my instruction, but will also test them on standardized tests. 
to see whether it's transferable. Um, that's kind of my take uh, on your question. I hope I answer it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you for the wonderful sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question.